Hey everyone, I'm here with Katie Wells, CTNC, MCHC founder and CEO of wellnessmama.com and wellness.com. A mom of six with a background in journalism, she took her health into her own hands and started researching to find the answers to her health struggles. Her research turned into a blog and podcast, and she's now written over 1,500 blog posts, three books, and was named one of the 100 most influential people in health and wellness. When she's not reading medical journals, creating new recipes, or recording podcasts, you can find her somewhere outside in the sun with her kids or undertaking some DIY remodeling project. Um, I, I've been following Katie for some time. I've known her for some time, and... Uh, she puts out some pretty interesting stuff. I, I respect her opinions, and I wanted to hear from her what she does to optimize her health. So the, the first question I typically like to ask is how you got into health. Like, what were the specific struggles that you were dealing with that got you into health? Well, thanks for having me. It's such an honor to get to chat with you. I know we've gotten to have some of these conversations at conferences and in person, and it's fun to get to record one. Um, for me, it was not at all an intentional decision, actually, to get into the health and wellness world. I actually, two things coincided that were the perfect storm for that. The first one, I had my first child, and while I was in my follow-up appointment at the doctor's office, I was waiting forever for the doctor. And I read in Time Magazine that for the first time in two centuries, the current generation of American children would have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. And holding my tiny newborn, that just struck me really hard, looking at his perfect face and realizing these stats of what his generation was going to face. And my background was in journalism up until that point. And I had no idea how I was going to do it. But in that moment, I resolved that I wanted to help be part of changing that statistic for his generation. And at the same time, the pregnancy had sort of catapulted me into some weird symptoms that I hadn't figured out. And aside from the normal postpartum ones, I was having strange symptoms pop up and it ended up being a long multi-year process before I started to get answers. And it was my frustration with conventional medicine and going in for testing and talking to doctors and not getting anywhere that led me into the research side. Thanks to the journalism background, my default had always kind of been when in doubt research. And so that's what I was doing and I started to uncover what is now thankfully very uh, widespread information, but it wasn't at that point 15 years ago um, about the link between, which at the time to me seemed, uh, you know, kind of um, mind blowing, but now seems very basic, but the link between nutrition beyond just calories and how our body feels and how it acts. And I started delving deep into different areas of nutrition and also eventually genetics and starting to put those pieces together for myself. And it's been kind of a long and circuitous circuitous journey. And what I realize now is there's so much individualization to it that um, now when I talk about it, I really hone in on the fact that it's extremely individualized and personalized, especially when we start talking about the genetic side. And I think while there's so many awesome experts out there and we can learn from everyone, at the end of the day, we're each our own primary health care provider and we each have the responsibility to figure out for ourselves what's going to help us live in the most optimal way possible. And I think I've now come much closer to doing that for myself. And I, if anything, I hope my journey that I share it is helpful as a framework for other people to start to figure out their own version. But I caution against, you know, with any expert, me included, don't just copy their blueprint because it's not going to work exactly the same for you because we are so individual. But I'm really grateful for the process of all that experimentation and everything I learned along the way. That's so interesting. Uh, we were actually thinking about calling this podcast the, you know, personalized health podcast because, you know, my the, my background is obviously self decode, and I had the same kind of moment as you, where I said, you know, what we're all individual here, and how often do you see that something works well for somebody and doesn't work well for somebody else? Right. I, I think there's a lot of basic education and there's a lot of things that a lot of good information that people should know and tools. Right. Uh, so there's always things you want to be educated on. But I feel like everything is, is individualized. And I mean, you know, obviously it's not going to be healthy. It's not going to be optimal for anybody to put toxins in their body. Right. But obviously the toxins are going to affect people in some ways more than others. Some people might get breast cancer from it. Some people might not. And so uh, in that sense, it is very individualized. Uh, let's talk about you for, for a bit. What, what kind of 
areas. I don't know if you're uh, open about like your personal stuff, uh, but if if you are, and, and feel free to go to, skip to the next question. What are the things that you're trying to improve? Because I'm I'm a big believer of having goals of like here's the things that I'm trying to improve, and then always trying to optimize those things. It's never an end. You don't end the battle because you're always also going up against aging as well. So it's always a not never ending battle of constantly trying to optimize. What are the things that you're trying to optimize that you really care about? That's a great question. And I a hundred percent agree with you. I think it's a journey and the goal is often shifting or advancing further as you learn more. Um, when I started, it was very much uh, extremely surface level in the very beginning of just, I was super tired and fatigued. My hair was falling out and I could not lose weight. And it didn't matter if I completely fasted or if I followed any kind of protocol and I followed all of them at different times. Um, and so I thought at the beginning that it was just kind of more of a, oh, I need to lose weight. And then eventually through research realized, okay, I have some lab numbers that are off, which led me into understanding more about the thyroid and Hashimoto's, eventually got a diagnosis of Hashimoto's. And so that was my focus for a lot of years. Um, now I'm completely Hashimoto's free, or I guess I would consider it in remission, but my labs are all completely normal without medication. Um, and so that was my kind of like first big goal was to get my body out of a state of inflammation and get my hormones functioning well again and get all my labs in normal range. And then once I accomplished that and I was able to also lose weight through that process, um, like you said, then the goal kind of shifts. And once I started really feeling great all the time, it kind of became a focus of, okay, now what can I do now that I actually have all this energy? So my current goals are um, much more around kind of anti-aging to your point and also athletics, which is interesting because my whole life, my parents were very academic focused and I was told you're not an athlete. I was kind of discouraged from sports when I was a kid. And so now in my you know, late thirties, I've taken that up as an endeavor and kind of this, I consider this the phase of my life of seeing how strong and how fast I can get, which I never thought I would start after having six kids. But it's been really fun actually to get to do this alongside my teenagers and to sort of use them as a benchmark for trying to maintain speed and strength. Um, so I've been lately doing a lot more research into things like how can I make sure my mitochondria are functioning optimally? How can I make sure my sleep is super dialed in so that my recovery is good? And then have been using metrics like lifting really heavy weights to see improvement in that area. And then I also uh, track some labs, just base labs at this point from the anti-aging perspective and kind of looking at keeping those biomarkers in good range as I do get older and being aware of that, not just from an aesthetic point of view, but more importantly, from a cellular point of view. Um, I think now with all the new research, there's so much within our grasp that we can, you know, have that data at home. We have wearables, we can access so much of our personalized data and really keep an eye on those things. Um, so that's, that's been my main focus. I've, like I said, lifting heavy weights and sprinting have been a couple of my athletic focus lately. And I've gotten now multiple lifts that are in the two times my body weight category, which was a recent goal. And so now it's just the fun part of like kind of pushing that and seeing how far it can go. That's so interesting. I, I feel like we've had a, a lot of similarities in, in our journey. For example, I came into it and I also just copied a lot of protocols and I was like, wait a second, this is not working on me the same way it's working on these people. Something's off here. And then, you know, I got into it deeper into the genetics and all these kinds of other things. And I was able to fix those core health issues, the, the big ones. And then I was like, hmm, I was able to accomplish this. Where is this going to stop? And I kept on, ha I keep on having more and more goals. And for me, it's, it's similar, whether it's sleep, anti-aging, uh, building muscle now, improving my brain function. You know, there's no limit in, in how much I can try to improve my brain function or how athletic you are. It's, it's just something that you, uh, you, you want to keep on trying. So that, that's very interesting. Which labs do you track, for example, for anti-aging? Recently, I've just been running kind of a comprehensive metabolic panel and watching those as benchmarks and just seeing them move continually in better and better directions. Um, I also, I, I love the wearable data that you can get at home. I think sometimes that can be even more valuable with the caveat related to the person's baseline. So for instance, we can now track HRV and sleep pretty accurately from home. And I think those are helpful metrics because I can see day to day how things I'm changing can are affecting those levels without having to get blood test. Um, and I'll do things like watching my recovery. If my resting heart rate at night is more than a couple points elevated, I know that's not going to be a good training day and I'm not going to push super hard that day. And I'm going to dial in my recovery better and then hit the heavy weights when my recovery is in a, in a better place. Um, and I've gotten to see some cool things with 
continually improving HRV, I think people can hyper-focus on that one a little bit and look at generalizations and think, oh, maybe mine's too low. Some people have theirs is like 120. Why is mine only like 60? But I think HRV is very relative to the person. And actually, from what I've seen and from experts I've talked to, you don't actually want to see huge, drastic changes in HRV in either direction. Um, because that can be actually pretty indicative of a problem as well. You can, like slow, steady improvement is awesome. But if you, for instance, doubled your HRV one day, that could also be a sign something is up or that you want to pay attention to that. Or uh, anecdotally, for me, I pretty much don't drink anymore because I've noticed even a glass of alcohol will tank my HRV. And I don't like seeing that big of a change in <laughs> HRV. And I'm like pretty clear my body doesn't love this right now. So I'm laughing because I also, uh, the same thing happened to me. I, I quit alcohol three weeks ago because every time I drank, I'm just like, oh, my HRV is tanking. My sleep is not as good. And, you know, is this really worth it, right? Like just taking in this toxin that reliably decreases my HRV. And I just decided it, it's just not worth it. There's there's other things that are uh, better. That, and that it's interesting. Too, I know you've done a whole lot with the genetics as well, but between genetics and watching that kind of data, I've also realized, like I was part of that early movement where we realized, okay, maybe saturated fat isn't as bad as they thought it was and maybe we actually need it. And I think that's true, but I have a couple really um, different genes that make me not respond super great to saturated fat. So through watching my own data, I've learned I feel much better actually on more like olive oil and even not low, low fat, but like moderate fat versus higher fat. So like keto doesn't Typically, I don't respond great to that. Um, so that's the thing I've learned through that and now pay attention to as well. That's interesting as well. I mean, I, I also genetically don't respond as well to saturated fat. I mean, I think there are some people that respond, like you said, in different ways based on their genetics. My LDL cholesterol and ApoB shoots up when I eat saturated fat. And ApoB actually is like very causative. It's like the number one causative agent of heart disease. And uh, according to my genetics, I also have – we have this, these polygenic risk scores, as, as you know, um, where I'm at elevated risk for various types of car, cardiovascular risk disease, uh, heart disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. And um, so I'm now trying – that's one of the – my goals now is to decrease ApoB, ApoB and LDL. So ApoB is the more direct measure. Uh, is that something uh, – do you care at all about your LDL cholesterol or is not not something you, you follow? I do keep an eye on it and um, there are certainly like heart issues have run on one side of my family, so I'm aware of it. Um, thankfully, my genes are pretty solid in most of the cardiovascular categories, um, but I do keep an eye on it just for that. My cholesterol actually um, – I kind of have followed the theory that in women especially, super low cholesterol is actually inversely correlated with longevity and for – in a lot of cases, women having higher cholesterol isn't necessarily a problem um, and can even be correlated with higher longevity, which kind of flies in the face of a lot of the conventional stuff that you'll read. Um, that said, mine actually stays naturally pretty low. It kind of sits around like 165 um, on average or lower. And my LDL cholesterol, yeah. Yeah, it has been great. Um, so I haven't had to pay special attention to that. Um, another interesting thing that I noticed just anecdotally myself was after years of dieting, I had... I was definitely over dieting and I had undernourished myself for so long. And then I had kind of bought into the whole carbs are bad mentality for so long. And it was so uh, ingrained in me that I had a really weird relationship with carbs. And through tracking my own data, I realized I actually needed a lot more carbs than I was eating, of course, from healthy sources. And I really enjoy things like sweet potatoes and squash and fruit and not like processed grain carbs, but it, adding more of those actually um, impacted my glucose pot in a positive direction and my insulin and all of those metrics and also really improve my recovery. And I think that's an important one that I like to mention for women because I think a lot of the um, diet wisdom out there for a long time has been, you know, avoid carbs, avoid fat and like eat them within the right ratios for your body. Figure that out certainly. But if you are drastically under eating anything and is certainly drastically under eating micronutrients, which come from some of these foods, you're going to put your body in a state of stress and under eating in general for women, I think has become... Uh, kind of rampant. And I think there's now more awareness about this. I'm excited to see more women talking about the importance of actually eating enough and kind of like reverse dieting. If you've lived in a deficit for so long, sometimes that is actually a huge key in recovery and anti-aging and a lot of these things we're talking about. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And we hear uh, everything is bad, right? I mean, you hear carbs are bad, fat is bad, and then you hear protein, like it increases mTOR and 
you know, too much. Maybe, you know, you hear stuff about kidneys and this, that, and the other, whatever. Uh, so everything is bad. I, I, I think <laughs> what, it, what it comes down to is what is good for your body, right? And what ratios. So it, I don't really see it as good or bad. I mean, we're all eating saturated fat. We're all eating unsaturated fat. We're all eating some fish oil in, in some amount. Um, we're all eating carbs in, in some amount. And the question is in what quantities and what sources and, and how you're doing that. And that's all very heavily dependent on genetics. What have you found that when you eat more fat, what happens? I definitely see trends in I, my my glucose level actually over time will rise a little bit. Um, my cardio measures typically stay still in pretty good range, but I just don't typically feel great. Um, I also found out for me, like coconut oil was the big thing for a long time. I actually had the top ranking post on coconut oil for years and I was very like pro coconut. And I think for a lot of people, it's phenomenal. My body just doesn't respond well to coconut in general, even, you know, not just coconut oil, but any kind of coconut product. So that's one I just avoid because I feel better, but I definitely notice a difference in how I feel if I'm getting too much saturated fat. And it also, I think is partially because saturated fat is very calorie dense and satiating. So when I was eating a lot of saturated fat, I wasn't getting as much of the other macros and probably as many micronutrients because in saturated fat, those there are certainly are micronutrients, but they're more limited and they're not as, there's not as wide of range as you get when you're eating a much more varied diet. So with a lot of the women I talk to, I encourage kind of step away from the calorie and macro model, which is so prevalent right now and start thinking in terms of like nutrient density per calorie. If you want something to focus on and aim for the maximum number of micronutrients and bioavailable micronutrients that I can get from food. Um, and that's been really helpful to me is having a positive metric to focus on versus like a deprivation metric to, to focus on. Uh, do you ever do any kind of like mega dosing experiments where you try one thing at a time, nothing else in a higher dosage to see how you feel? <laughs> I have some, and I'm taking a much more moderate approach typically right now because I spent a lot of time dialing that in. Um, and right now I'll do pretty specific supplements and I often cycle them. So that's one of my things I am uh, pretty consistent with is I don't do anything every single day, including including even eat, including supplements. Like I try to, my one of my goals is metabolic flexibility right now. And so I try to mix up the amount of food I'm eating, the macros of the food I'm eating and the supplements all the time with kind of the idea that I don't want my body to habituate to anything. And certainly with supplements, I don't want my body to get used to always getting an outside source of nutrients um, from a supplement in a really high dose. Um, but I have experimented with, I've been experimenting with peptides some and experimenting with higher doses of certain like amino acids, for instance, and or um, I don't like eating eggs that much and I don't do well with eggs at certain times. So I was realizing I was low in choline. So I supplemented with relatively big doses of different types of choline for a while. And that was amazing. My brain felt like it turned on and I had so much focus. Um, but I think it just, again, speaks to that really personalized aspect. And so when people ask me like, what exactly are you doing? I'm like, with the caveat, don't copy this exactly because it's not going to work the same for you. These are the things I figured out that have really helped me. How many supplements do you take a day, let's say? Um, I would say eight to 10 some days. Um, some days if I'm working out really hard, I'll take more. But then there are a lot of days where I don't take any. As a general rule, I don't take supplements on the weekends just to give my body a break. And often when I'm traveling, I won't take anything with me just because it's easier and then it gives my body a reset as well. Um, and I also incorporate fasting a decent amount, not as much as I did when I was in a much more active recovery um, from Hashimoto's mode. And that's another example of, you know, often you hear fasting isn't good for women. And I think that can be the case. And certainly, you know, pregnant women, nursing women should not fast because they have a much higher nutrient need during that time. But for me, my hormones responded great to fasting. I kept a close eye on everything. And I even for a while was doing, you know, seven to 10 day fast occasionally or three to five day fast once a month. And that was really, really instrumental for me in the initial phase of getting all my labs into normal range. And now I just do it much more as a maintenance. And then at the beginning of every year, I do a seven or 10 day fast, which for me now is much more for the mental and spiritual benefits than for the physical benefits. I don't actually think it's um, beneficial in all cases to fast that long for most people. I think it was helpful for me healing, but now I don't actually need it physically. It's just more of a mental, spiritual focus for me. Interesting. Very interesting. What do you feel mentally and spiritually from fasting after, I like, take me through that because I've never done that more than 24 hours. 
Oh, wow. Um, well, I yeah. think the data is really fascinating. And I'm sure you've talked about like the data on just intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding, eating in a more narrow window. It's actually really drastic stats and, you know, pre-diabetics and diabetics, they've taken them through a intermittent fasting protocol and seen their labs improve a lot. I think that is one thing that I would say is a general guideline short of medical issues is most people just shortening the window in which you're eating a little bit can be really helpful because we are all technically fasting at night unless you're waking up every three hours to eat. Um, right. So everyone is capable of fasting. And if you eat in maybe just an eight to 10 hour window and experiment with that instead of a 17 hour window, which is the average in the US, you might see some benefits from that without even changing what you're eating or re trying to reduce your calories intentionally. Um, the longer fast, I think are really fascinating because there's some cool research coming out about the gut reset aspect. And then also once you hit past that three or five day point, um, the ability of it to kind of like, create autophagy in the body and do some cellular cleanup. Um, I always start the year with that. And it's kind of my um, process. I reread Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And to me, fasting that long is just a great reminder that we can do hard things. And also like when you take away something that's a daily part of your life, you create not just more actual time, but I feel like more mental bandwidth. And I end up getting to be very reflective during that time. Um, also, because my body responds really well to fasting, by about one day in, I start feeling, I'm probably on ketones at that point, and I start feeling super focused and clear. Uh, I don't get this lump that a lot of people get when they're fasting. So that's my intensive like planning for the year. If I have any massive creative projects, I'm working on them during that time. Um, and I just feel like I typically feel awesome while fasting. So if anything, I have to kind of like limit myself to not fast too much because I feel so good. Um, but I think that's going to be, of course, different for everybody. It's also funny that during my times of long fast, I get the compulsive need to feed my kids. I don't know if it's like a survival thing of like my body thinks it's dying. So I like feed the children, but I get all my best recipe testing done when I'm on a long fast and I'm not eating at all. That's so interesting. I have a different experience with fasting and that's kind of why I don't do it. I like, I get my brain just starts shutting down if I'm fat. Like, I'm, I get my my energy systems start shutting down. Um, my brain starts shutting down. I don't. I just don't have enough energy or motivation to do anything. That's why. And so I'm, I just think like, you know, I could try doing it, but then I could be wasting like five days in in some way. You know, wasting like not enjoying it. It's also not enjoyable for me. So. Uh, but I feel like it's an it's interesting that you have a completely different experience where you actually get energy, you you have energy, your brain is working really well. I think the ketones help a bit, but I also think that I have a lot of muscle and not a lot of fat, and I start breaking down muscle. I think that's part of the problem. So I just don't I don't know. I, it it doesn't seem to work as well for me, but I feel like I want to do it at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's worth doing for most people, at least to experiment with once. And it's great. Like it resets your body of any tolerance of anything that you're habitually used to like caffeine. And so I feel like by doing that, especially once a year, it's like, I reset my caffeine tolerance. I reset glucose. I reset a lot of things. Mm. My gut feels way different. And then when I, you know, drink coffee again, it feels like 10 times the effect because I've reset. Wow. So which supplements do you take? What are some of the main ones that you take? Um, like and I said, I vary it a lot. Yeah. Um, I take right now, I've been experimenting with a lot of added aminos because they're more bioavailable form of protein. And with the amount of athletic stuff I'm doing, it's really helpful for recovery. Um, I also experiment pretty consistently with different forms of choline. So like hospital choline is great for me for focus and for sleep. Um, so that's one I take relatively consistently. I know you and I have both written a lot about magnesium. Um, that's one of the few that I take almost all the time, along with a couple strains of probiotics. Oh, go ahead. You find the uh, phosphatidylcholine is better than alpha GPC or city choline, CDP choline? I take all three at different times. Um, mm. For me personally, I seem to notice the most from the phosphatidylcholine, but because I was choline deficient for so long, I end up taking a lot of different forms and have still taken pretty big doses of that one and feel great from that. Um, I've been experimenting a little bit with pregnenolone recently. Um, that's a newer experimentation for me. And it seems helpful hormonally and also definitely for focus. Um, well, how many, what's the dosage there? I keep pretty low dose on that. Like usually like 50 and I still 50 milligrams. That. Okay. 50 yeah. is not a low dosage. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are people definitely, I've, you know, read a lot of people taking like 600 or more at different times as a loading. Oh, wow. That. Okay. That's crazy. I I've been taking 25 milligrams 
for uh, eight years pretty consistently. Right. Yeah. What have you noticed from that? Is that like that's a pretty regular one for you? Yeah, it's a it's a regular one for me. I just find that it's good for brain function and also motivation. Those are the two things that I know the, the two main benefits I notice. It definitely increases motivation and improves brain function. Makes Have sense. you noticed any differences in motivation? Um, a little bit. That's not an area I've typically struggled with much, um, but I do have a kind of stack of a bunch of, I guess, what would be considered nootropics that I take on big focus days. And I try not to take that regularly because I enjoy the big effects when I take that whole stack together. What, um, what are some of those things, the nootropics? Um, alpha GPC, huprazine, the phosphatidylcholine, um, and then the, I think what used to be called Siltep and is now called Neuro Effect or something like that. Um, my body responds to that one pretty well. I think there is a whole lot of variation when it comes to nootropics as well. Like, sure. um, and I have some inverse modulation in a couple of things. So for instance, I have to take magnesium in the morning. Most people find if they take it at night, it helps them sleep. And if I take magnesium at night or GABA or anything with cannabinoids in it, I'm up all night. So I've learned. I'm, to take I'm, by the way, I'm the same as you. Magnesium wakes me up. So yeah, I, I it, it learned... worsens my sleep. Yeah, that's, that, so we probably have a similar gene in that with inverse modulation of those specific compounds. What have you found helped, let's say, your sleep? Definitely moving magnesium to the morning made a big difference. I cut off caffeine by noon, which that seems like a pretty good general recommendation for most people. Um, that, morning sunlight, here. not supplementation. This is one of the few things that I would say is a universal recommendation. I've never seen anyone not benefit from is when you wake up, get outside not through a window, but outside as soon as possible and spend half an hour out there. I think for me, that's a great time to spend time with my kids or just get in the grass and stretch, drink a bunch of water. Um, that seems to make a huge difference with all the research being around that sort of starting your circadian clock, which makes a big difference for sleep. And it, I think people often ignore that one because it feels like, well, that's in the morning. How is it going to make such a big difference for my sleep? Um, but to me, that makes even a bigger difference than avoiding artificial light at night, which I think is also a a great thing to do. Um, I've also experimented with when working through the Hashimoto's and now continually still do the sum, experimenting with different enzymes like protolytic enzymes um, for keeping kind of cellular health. And then also sometimes I'll take those at night. Those don't seem to negatively impact my sleep. I don't know if they necessarily enhance it, but um, that's been one thing that I think is generally helpful. And then I also love reishi tea at night. That one for me personally seems to help with sleep quite a bit. I found um, a certain variety of reishi tea actually helped with my REM sleep. The only problem with reishi tea at night is it makes me want to go to pee in the middle of the night. Um, so I haven't figured out how to, like, it's kind of like this benefit, but also this negative. Do you find that, that, that it causes you to do that or no? No, I don't drink it with a lot of water. I also try to cut water uh, off a couple hours before bed. So mm. it's a, like pretty strong, but not a lot of volume of tea. Okay. Um, I also think one advantage I have there is having had six pregnancies. I, I think my bladder got super strong from having to like having okay. a baby sitting on it for a solid decade. So I think I'm an outlier in that probably. Uh, that could be, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's so interesting how, you know, some things are like spot on some, you know, some things are just, you know, we have different genetics and stuff. So t tell me about uh, some of the like super successful health, health experiments you've done. What are some of the most health, uh, beneficial health experiments that you've done that you found is like, okay, that, that was a game changer for me. The two that come to mind, um, not to keep beating that horse, but I think fasting was big for me. And I think experimenting with the, the method. So maybe for you, it would just be like time restricted eating. Um, Which but I it do. Seems like, yeah. It seems like for in general in the U S at least for me, this was the case in the past. Like we think we're only eating three meals a day, but if you look at the data, most of us are in a continual feed window because unless you are not consuming any calories between those three meals, most people are actually eating somewhat consistently for the whole time that they're awake. Um, and so I think experimenting with that has been extremely successful for me. And it just seems like for me personally, it gives me a whole lot of leeway. Like eating in a more narrow window lets me not really have to like pay attention to or restrict food as much, um, especially now that I'm in a time of sort of like trying to build muscle. If anything, I'm paying attention to eating enough during that time, but giving myself a break between meals and not just kind of like snacking on a handful of food while I'm working or something, that gives the liver a break. And I think um, liver health, paying attention to liver health has also been a really key thing um, because it's controlled so much, obviously. Um, getting my light exposure dialed in was really, really, really helpful. 
Um, and then actually for me, one of the ones that's made the most positive effect recently has been upping my protein consumption. I know you mentioned we have to be careful with mTOR. I feel like I'm in a very much a safe range for that. But when I started tracking, I was under eating protein for such a long time, even while pregnant and nursing, that I think there's been a lot of rebuilding my body's been doing with enough protein consumption. Um, and so that's been really, really amazing. And to see the muscle growth happen right, really quickly when I got my protein in the correct range. And by the way, I'm, I'm actually with you there. I do better with higher levels of protein. I was just saying what other people are saying. You know, there's a lot of bad talk about protein. I think for me, it works very well. And I think especially once I started working out, it's, you know, you need more protein. There's no, right? I mean, there's some like vegan people talking about you can get your protein from plants. <laughs> there's no way, like, even though I'm eating a lot of meat, you still can need extra protein. So, uh, yeah, I think protein is, is really important. It's one I actually have to be pretty intentional with to actually get enough. Um, and some things I do that are definitely odd that seem to help this one, especially is in the morning, I'll often swallow pieces of raw liver. I don't like the taste of liver and I don't like having to take a thousand capsules of liver. So I just cut up liver and swallow some chunks of it in the morning. And that seems to give me a whole lot of energy and also helps just early morning protein. And then I also have been supplementing with aminos in addition, just because it is actually hard for me to eat enough protein to get the range where I feel the best. Interesting. Interesting. What was the last time you changed your mind about something in health? Ooh, I love this question. Um, I think all the time, I think we see, I think that's actually one of the fun aspects of getting to be in this world is and continually exposed to the research. And I've seen the waves of all these things happen. Um, like I mentioned for me personally with the saturated fat and then realizing that's not great for me, still could be great for other people. Um, I think the omega-3 fish oil debate has been really fascinating. And I would say I'm still in the process of, um, I would mark myself as undecided on certain aspects of consumption of fish oil right now. Um, so I opt to mostly get it from food when possible. But that was one that for a long time, I was very pro fermented cod liver oil, for instance. And then now I'm very much kind of undecided and wouldn't necessarily recommend fermented cod liver oil, at least at this point. Um, same thing with protein consumption, like wasn't something I paid attention to at all. Now I'm very much pro that. Um, but I think it's just a constant flux and journey of changing my mind about that. Okay. What is the single like biggest health hack you wish you knew before? Ooh, another great question. Um, from a physical standpoint, I would say the morning sunlight is a big one and it's free and I would recommend it universally to everyone. I wish that is something I would have, I think would have helped hormonally a ton had I known about it a lot earlier. Um, I think another one that is going to like a little bit vary from just the physical aspects of health, but for a lot of years, I pretty much entirely ignored the connection of like mental health and emotions to physical health. And I know this has been talked about a lot now in the health world through things like the body keeps the score and understanding the connection between mind and body. Um, I wish I had known to look into that a lot sooner because I was definitely for a lot of years operating from sort of kind of a trauma informed or trauma induced point and didn't realize it and thought like, no, I'm just this driven because I enjoy it. And it's really, really fun. And it wasn't until I unpacked all the layers of the mental and emotional side that I realized, yes, and also I'm doing this out of a compulsion to avoid having to face some of these emotional things. And that was another big key for me that I think I don't talk about as much because I think it a little bit tiptoes into the realm of the woo and people can tend to zone out. But it wasn't until I addressed some of those more severe emotions that were actually keeping me in a state of stress and sympathetic nervous system and fight or flight that I was able to get the a lot of those labs in really good range. And it turns out, you know, if your body is operating as if you're running for your life, you're just not going to optimally digest and you're not going to optimally, optimally sleep and your hormones aren't going to be optimal because your body thinks it has a bigger concern. And I think that's one that's definitely entered the conversation now and that we probably have a lot more to learn about, but I wish I had learned about that side and learned about things like meditation and of letting go of those negative emotions a lot earlier because I think it's an area where that can also be discounted because it's not a supplement we can take and it is not a food we can eat, but I think it's also a very real part of the health conversation. So th that brings me to the next topic that I think is quite interesting. Mood is like a very important, you know, a topic that I'm really into. What are the things that, what are the top things that you've done to, to enhance your mood? And it's also one of those things that you can do a lot to enhance, right? It's not, I mean, some, 
things in health. I, I feel like there's a lot of things in health you can do to enhance, but mood is definitely one of them. Uh, what are, what are some of the top things that you've done? Yeah, very multifaceted. I think um, I, uh, most people, I think, would agree that like, sleep is a huge key of that. And then we know if you are getting poor sleep, not just are your you know cortisol levels, your glucose, those are all going to be out of range. Your hormones over time are going to suffer, but your mood is just not going to be great. And I see that as a mom. If I get a poor night of sleep, I'm much less naturally patient with my kids. It takes a lot more effort to be patient. Um, so I think sleep is the first thing to really dial in there. Um, I also noticed when I started like changed my mindset from trying to lose weight and deprive myself to like, how do I optimally nourish myself and more focused on the nutrient conversation? Um, that made a huge difference in my mood, which makes complete sense. If you, your body feels malnourished, you're not going to feel your best. You're not going to be in your best um, kind of mental state at all times. And then I think there's that very personalized aspect of experimentation. Once you get the big pieces in line with whether it be taking different nootropics or supplements, whatever the it's going to work for you and getting those dialed in over time. Um, to your point, you know, maybe introducing one at a time so you can actually really tangibly see how it's impacting you. I think that makes a huge difference. And I think for me, that was a multi-year process of getting all of those factors dialed in and knowing how I was going to respond to different supplements. And now I feel like 99% of the time, my mood is extremely stable, even when there's a lot of like tumultuous things happening in my life. Uh, so we were talk talking about labs before. What labs do you have that are, let's say, out of range or that you're trying to improve or work on right now? So that's the interesting thing. For the first time in my adult life, the last three years, I have had no labs out of range at all. And, and not even like on the, I, I caution people, like don't go, just go with the normal range on wherever you're getting tested, because I know you've written about this as well. Often the averages are established by averages of the people getting tested and or just um, what they view as like certain age groups. And so if you are a younger person trying to live optimally, um, you don't just want to be in the normal range necessarily on a lab test. You want to actually research like for my age and my goals, what is the range that I want to be in for this? Um, and it took me a, several years to get, especially like my fasting glucose down, um, to get all my hormones in good range, to get the thyroid, to get off the medication and then have my thyroid levels stay and not have antibodies go up at all. Um, so now there's, it's more of, I'm working on just improving physical metrics related to those and keeping the labs in good range. Cause even like inflammatory markers are all in perfect range and all that. So for the first time ever, I don't have any that are out of range on labs. That's incredible. That's incredible. Have you uh, uploaded them to, uh, I, I know you, you have uh, self decode. Um, have you ever uploaded the labs self decode? It's just, I, when I did it, it was interesting. Like it was, it was a different experience. I uploaded all my labs. I was able to just see it very clearly, like how my labs were changing over time. And, and, and that, I thought that was pretty cool, but I, I haven't uploaded my more recent ones. And that's a great reminder because it's actually been on my list. And I definitely will plug that because that's a self decode in general has been super helpful for me. And I loved all the genetic data that you guys give and all the explanation. I think that's a super valuable tool. If anyone, if you tested your genetics, running them through or testing with you guys, if you haven't is awesome. Um, and then adding that lab piece is incredible because I know you've talked about this, but it's one thing to have labs that are looking at, you know, average labs in normal range, but you guys are taking it to the point of here's your genes, here's your labs, here's how all these things are interacting together. And we've never really had access to that granular of data individually before without working with experts and paying thousands and thousands of dollars. So I love that you have made that available. It's a great reminder to add those back in. And I'm sure it'll probably give me some suggestions of things I can play with that I haven't thought of yet. What was the most inter interesting thing you found out about your DNA? Um, well, there's so many interesting things and you guys have so much good data. Um, I'm trying to think, cause I ran me and I ran all my kids also at the same time. And it was really fascinating to get to see like what they got from me, what they got from their dad and what their strengths and weaknesses were, which has definitely influenced how we even like cook as a family, trying to make sure I hit everybody's sort of high points and avoid the offenders for a lot of people. Um, I think for me, it was fascinating to realize having considered myself not athletic, that I actually had a whole lot of fast twitch muscle and was probably like more naturally inclined to that than I thought I was. And it was maybe it was, you know, the power of suggestion, but realizing that I think helped me lean into that and not be afraid to try some of the athletic stuff. Um, I think learning about methylation was life-changing. I don't have the more severe MTHFR mutations, but just getting those pieces dialed in makes a huge difference. And I think obviously for people who have the homozygous or the more severe mutations, that is absolutely life-changing. Um, 
I'm trying to think what else was the most enlightening and surprising about that. Um, probably those would top the list. Um, for my kids, it was interesting to see some of them have like very high protein requirements based on their genes. And so getting those things dialed in for them has made a big difference. Um, I think understanding your kids' genetics is a very underrated parenting tool because just like adults, if they're not being fueled correctly, they're more stressed, their mood is off, their sleep is not great. And, um, you know, I'm yet to meet a parent who doesn't want their kid to have better sleep and more focus and better mood. And often it, these are, you know, I, I think about genetics as far as like, we can eat food, of course, to fuel our body. But when you understand the genetic side, if you're kind of like unkinking the hose, if you have a slow point that's not working well because of genetics and you fix that, it's like you have so much more flow into whatever that area is that you just function so much better. And it's so exciting to live in a time where we can do that at home now. Right. I, I agree. It's it's really incredible. And every, every year, the technology is really progressing rapidly. That it, something I'm super excited about as well. How... How long do you expect to live? Like, what's your expectation? What's your goal and how long do you want to live? Mm, I don't know if I've set a number goal per se. I definitely would love to hit over 100, which I think is going to become very doable for a lot of people within our lifetime and certainly within our children's lifetime. Um, I think I'm focused more on health span. I know there are people like Dave Asprey who have a very clear 180-year-old number. Um, for me, I want to live as long as I can and still be you know, picking up my grandkids or great grandkids and doing activities with them and moving around and fully self-sufficient. Um, I've gotten to, in my life, volunteer quite a bit with hospice and end of life care. And I, it's such an honor to get to be present for people during that time of life. But I've also seen how difficult it is for people when their body doesn't respond anymore and they're not able to function. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I now am so focused on things like maintaining muscle mass and avoiding, you know, sarcopenia and muscle loss as we age, because it, to me, it's not just about the number, but it's about the functionality and the quality of life within that number. And with so many kids, I realize hopefully I'll have lots of grandkids and great grandkids one day. And I want to be able to keep up with them and maybe be, you know, playing soccer with them when I'm a hundred. So that's the goal. That's I, I agree. Health span is, is way more important than lifespan. There's some people that are just like living uh, to an old age, but they're, they're, you know, they're disabled or whatever. They got all these issues. I'd rather live a shorter life, but in a, in a really great way than a, a long life, you know, being disabled. My and and question, yeah. I would say ironically, the data too is interesting that if we are aware and kind of ponder our mortality often, it actually correlates ironically with a longer lifespan. Um, but being aware of our mortality tends to actually make us have a longer and happier life. And so I actually have a tattoo on my wrist that says memento mori. That's like my daily reminder of that you're going to die. And um, there's been a lot of research around that. And the Stoics talk often about remember your mortality. That's very interesting. It's something I feel like I should do more. <laughs> it's a good, uh, it's a good tip. Uh, with my last question is, what do you think makes you successful? What are the qualities or things that you do? It could be anything. Mm, I would have had such a different answer to this a few years ago, and I would have talked to you about systems and checklists and processes, and I have a lot of those. I'm very much a spreadsheet person. Um, but I think I've realized as I've gotten older that at the end of the day, I think it comes down to giving a damn more and loving more. And uh, as maybe esoteric as it's going to sound, I think the answer is almost always love and choosing love in any given situation. And that's huge for your own mental health. It's huge for your interactions with other people, um, for your stress levels. And so my hope is, and my journey in life and continuing, continuing to be more so this way is that it's hopefully because I love better. And that's a question I ask myself internally often in interactions with people is like, how can I love this person best in this moment and still love myself at this moment? That was the part that was a big key for me to learn with boundaries too, is like, how do I love both this other person and myself in the best way possible at this moment? That's a great answer. And I think that probably makes you a lot happier as well. And being happy probably makes you more effective. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's, that's a really great answer. All right. Uh, it's been super, it's been a super pleasure to have you on and I learned quite a bit uh, and I uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Is there anything you want to share or promote or anything? I'm just wellness mama everywhere online. I have the blog, which has a lot of articles in the podcast um, for people who are looking for any specific topic um, and the books you mentioned as well. But um, it was an honor to get to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I've used self to code tools for so long and 
am deeply, deeply grateful for, to you for creating these and making them available to everybody and helping people have their health in their own hands. So um, it's truly an honor to get to talk to you today. Thank you so much. I had no, just for the viewers, I had no idea that she's going to say this. <laughs> this wasn't planned at all, um, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.